<laughs> All right. Well, cool. So uh, I'm glad everyone's here. Uh, hopefully this will be entertaining. And I, I do mean for this to be uh, a conversation, definitely going both directions. So feel free to stop and ask questions. Um, one thing that I'll say up front, um, I uh, wrote a, a book. I've, I've actually written two books on secular themes. One was uh, a book of essays that I wrote as I was uh, going public as an atheist. If you don't know my backstory, I used to be a Southern Baptist minister and uh, was uh, heavy into apologetics and engaging with with people like me today, right? Um, and, and trying to defend the faith. And I've, you know, as my journey has progressed and flipped to the other side, I, I really haven't changed my personality, right? It's, now I'm just, I keep doing the same thing and for the same reasons, right? Um, so I wrote a book on that. Uh, tonight's discussion um, is based more on the second book I wrote. Um, it's uh, uh, a book called When Seekers Ask, right? Um, and it's a play on words of, a, of an old apologetics book um, that where um, I go into a lot of how do we have discussions with each other when we're coming from, you know, if it's a Christian and a, uh, a, and a Muslim or, a, or atheist and a, and a Buddhist or whatever, how, how can we have a productive discussion where we're all on the same page, we're all playing the same game um, and kind of setting the ground rules? Because if you've engaged with people who believe differently than you, odds are you've had the experience of, uh, you know, people, you know, both of you walking away thinking that the other person just doesn't get it, right? Um, and it's because in a lot of cases, someone's playing uh, rummy and the other one's playing uno, right? You're both at a card table, you both have cards, but um, there are no, there is no game that you know, you're both having agreed upon set of rules to. So um, that book, um, it's like three bucks for the Kindle version on Amazon, but um, I am going to be emailing Emily a copy of it tonight, PDF. Um, and so, uh, and she'll, she has my permission to share that. And you guys have permission to share it. I'm not trying to make money on the, on the book. You have to put a price on it for them to keep it on Amazon. So um, uh, anyone who, if you don't get a copy within the next 48 hours and you want one, uh, just make sure and tell her to do her job because uh, it's gone there. All right. So tonight's topic is, um, the, you know, throwing water on the power of prayer, right? Um, so, and, and I'll, I'll apologize. Uh, sometimes I, I can get a little... Uh, emotional when I'm talking about certain topics, um, and this is one where sometimes it hits pretty hard. Um, so a few years back, the the big ice bucket challenge that uh, came out where people were, you know, for uh, ALS, you know, dumping bucket water in your head, challenge three of your friends, and then everyone donates five bucks or however it worked, right? Um, and it raised an amazing amount of money uh, for ALS research, which at the time um, was one of the most underfunded uh, diseases known to man. It's, uh, the, the problem is it's got an extremely high mortality rate. It's nearly 100%. There are some very famous exceptions like Stephen Hawking, but, um, uh, and, and the more, and you're, you know, we're, we're talking a matter of months after you get diagnosed, that's how long you have to live. So, you know, drug companies, they're not incented to uh, invest in those kinds of drugs from a financial perspective, because um, the amount of time that a patient would be taking their drugs or treatments is, is really small window, right? So, um, you know, huge deal, made a lot of difference. There were actually some breakthroughs just a couple of years later, right, as a result of this research and all this money that, that came in. Um, this, this mattered to me because um, one of my best friends uh, is a guy who lives in my neighborhood. Um, and about six months before the ice bucket challenge became a thing, his mom was diagnosed with ALS. And so the timing of everything, she was in the, she was degrading and she did end up passing away uh, about a year later. Um, and, but the, the timing of it was something that will probably stick with me, right, for the rest of my life. Because, um, you know, all the questions about, you know, you know handling the, the death of a parent and it's just one of those slow marches, but you know where it's heading and, and all the emotional stuff that that dredges up. Um, and then also in part because, you know, for my friend, 
uh, that now he has a 50% chance of having the the genetic propensity to have ALS himself. His kids have you know 25% chance and all the just ethical stuff that goes into do you get tested and what do you do if you find out you've got it and you know whatever right. So that's not the point of the talk though, right? Um, at, at the time, there were um, a number of Christian bloggers and writers, um, and, I, 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 and I, I try not to dog too much on Christianity in general because there are a lot of very, very nice, fine people who are Christians. We disagree on the whole whether or not there's a God thing. Other than that, there's not a lot we disagree on, right? So I, I, I have nothing against Christian Christians as a whole, right? But there were a significant number of Christian writers, authors, bloggers, who um, were writing about uh, you know, our over-reliance on science and research and we, if the country would just get back on its knees and, you know, back, turn back to God and blah, 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 then suddenly, you know, we'd, have, we'd see miracles and we'd see healings and we'd see all this stuff. Um, and that really irritated me. Um, in part because I used to wholeheartedly believe it, right? I was one of those guys who would have said this. Um, and I would have just, and, and I would have thoroughly believed if I just believe hard enough, if I just pray and I just want God to do something enough, then it, it's going to happen, right? Um, but personal experiences, life experiences, and paying attention to those and being willing to push on those um, really took me down a different path uh, as, as, as this journey. You know, you, you, you test your faith enough times and it keeps not working, right? Um, then, you know, that, 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 that becomes a, a pattern that you need to pay attention to, right? Um, but on the flip side, there are people in religious communities, and it's by far not just Christianity, right? People in Muslim communities, people in Hindu communities, people in Buddhist communities, people who experience miraculous events all the time. And you know, I, a friend of mine just recently, again, good friend, smart guy, blah, 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 but he goes on Facebook to tell his story about a miracle that he experienced. And he wanted to testify about the power of this miracle. And you know, it was, it was an interesting story, right? Um, he's pulling out in traffic and a guy is waving him on and there's some guy who's barreling down a turn lane at 50 miles an hour who really shouldn't be there, blah, blah, blah. My, um, my friend happens to see it at just the right time. He's a little more cautious than he otherwise might have been and thus he avoids getting hit and potentially dying. And so as a result, he says, oh, well, hey, you know, praise Jesus because if it weren't for uh, weren't for that supernatural intervention, I wouldn't I wouldn't be here. Um, I don't engage online with those kind of conversations. A, they, that's not why they posted it, right? Uh, they they don't they don't need me correcting <laughs> their their misunderstanding of you know chaos theory and how chance works and you know the difference between luck and supernatural and intervention. But there are times. Um, in, in my life, and in particular, where I was really, really, really good at what I called detecting the fingerprints of God, right? Have you guys had anyone who's used that phrase on you for God's fingerprints? So basically what, what that means is, is, um, you know, God obviously doesn't show himself fully because we then we, faith wouldn't need to be here because we'd see it, right? So the way that you detect God is by looking for little things that are improbable and these improbable series of events lead you to uh, understand that what has happened is supernatural influence, right? Um, I had all kinds of stories uh, from the time I was like a teenager until, you know, even young adult career things, decisions that I made, little things like that. And, and you just, you piece the, you, you piece the pieces together and wow, I mean, what are the odds of this happening and this happening and then this happening and then this happening all in the right sequence for the perfect time so that this outcome resulted. Wow. Thank you, Jesus, because otherwise there's no way to explain it. Now. Some of you guys who have been involved in debates and this kind of thing, I try to avoid a lot of technical jargon in my talks, but uh, I'm, I'm describing a fallacy. Does anyone know what the name of that fallacy is? 
The gambler's fallacy, it's also, uh, there's sharpshooter is the other name for it, right? Basically what it is, is this, it's this idea where you take a gun, you aim it at a barn, and you shoot it, random spot. Then you walk over, and after the hole is in the side of the wall, you paint a target right around the hole, and thus you have hit a perfect bullseye. What are the odds of hitting that perfect bullseye? Well, they're next to zero, right? Because after the fact, you are attributing that's where the target was. Right, and that's it's called the sharpshooter fallacy. But when you are engaging with um, people on topics like this, this is where it becomes important to make sure, like I said at the beginning, you're playing the same game in the discussion. So first off, the question is, what is the goal of the conversation? Do you actually want to know why your story has no effect on me as a non-believer? Yes or no? Because if they don't, then they, you know, there, there's really no point in engaging, right? So we, just, we start from the standpoint of, is this a conversation worth having? The second one is, um, or, or the second component of that is, assuming we both have the same goal in mind, we do want to know whether there is a natural explanation for these supposedly supernatural events, then the second goal is, how are we going to determine? What, what are the tools that we use in order to say, well, I, I know that this is supernatural because, and the interesting and risky part of this is that both parties need to be going into the conversation with this understanding that we have an agreed upon set of rules. We've not examined the evidence yet. We've not actually looked at any of the evidence. If I cannot, in a, in a natural, from a naturalist perspective, explain what's happened here, I'm gonna give you some credit. If there is no natural explanation, then that event that happened is evidence of the supernatural. And if you're someone who is just really, man, I'm, I'm, I'm not only an atheist, I'm a hard atheist, right? Uh, that, that can be a little bit of a, of, of a challenge to just start from the standpoint of, uh, yep, there's, there's a really good chance I could be wrong. The trick is, not only do you have to walk into the conversation from that perspective, so does the other party. All right? So assuming you both have the same goal, we want to determine is there supernatural influence or no. And assuming we agree on the rules of the game. And assuming we are coming from a standpoint of here, if I'm wrong, I will give credit to your side of the argument and vice versa. If I'm right, you will give credit to my side of the argument. We're not determining total truth with one discussion, but we at least want to make sure that we've got the same starting point. Um, those can actually be interesting conversations, right? What I found is most people have one of them with me, right? They'll do it one time and then they never want to do it again. And that's fine. That's completely fine if that's what they want to do. Um, you know, I'm happy to talk about anything. I'm not an atheist evangelist, right? Um, but um, it's, it, it's something that can save you a lot of grief, a lot of headache. Again, you know, save you a lot of energy in conversations that really aren't going to go anywhere in the first place, assuming you start from <clears throat> those set of rules. So in, in the book, I go through... Um, like things about how, how you evaluate evidence, right? There are chapters, like what I call thinking about thinking, right? Uh, how do we determine what's true? We talk about the uh, philosophical concepts, like the law of non-contradiction. We talk about, um, you know, something cannot both be true and false at the same time, basically, right? Um, uh, I, I talk about um, things like if you have uh, two competing theories and both theories are equally good at, rep at, at predicting future behavior, right? One theory has three components, the other one has 12 components. You discard the one with 12 components. If the one with three is just as good, now if the one with 12 is a little bit better, you keep that one, right? But so it's like, make it as simple as possible, but no simpler, right? Uh, but if the one with three is just as good, meaning if I can explain everything that happens without God, and you say, okay, everything happened, but I also believe that it's God, God's a pretty big extra 
thing to be adding to the mix, right? So, you know, so there's a whole set of ground rules. But again, specifically tonight, how do we look at miraculous events as atheists, right? How do we, how do we look at things that admittedly are really improbable that happen to people and, and explain those away? All right, so one of the examples that I give, uh, and I'm paraphrasing badly here, in the book is you, you've got a guy, and I call him Magic Man A. Magic Man A um, claims that he has supernatural crystals, and these crystals have the power to save him from harm. They protect him. He fully believes this. He sells these crystals to people. And he absolutely believes that they are going to benefit him. And he's got multiple stories of this. But one of them in particular is really um, improbable, right? So Magic Man A is in an airport. And he... Uh, you know, it, it's late, he's tired, he really wants to get on that plane and go home, and he gets kicked off the plane. Plane is too full, uh, there's like a medical passenger that takes seat, and so Magic Man A and four or five other people get booted off of the airplane. Um, that airplane crashes, and everyone aboard it dies. Now, if you're Magic Man A, what are you going to think? Or what are you going to tell people you think, whether you believe it or not? What saved you from that plane crash? Your crystals. I got, I got superpowers and crystals. And what these kinds of arguments do is they go back and they use statistics. And they are accurate in their use of statistics, which is one of the things that makes it maddening, right? Because your odds of getting kicked off of a commercial flight are something like 1 in 250,000. Right? So just the fact that you get kicked off of a flight, pretty rare. The odds of that plane actually crashing, so you get kicked off the flight, planes that are actually crashing is like one in another, like 1.5 million or so. I mean, it's ridiculously, ridiculously unlikely that a plane is going to crash. And so not only did a plane crash, but you got kicked off of that plane. So math heads, we multiply those two probabilities together and come out with, man, the odds of me getting kicked off of the flight that was going to crash if I was on it was one in 150 million, or whatever the number is, right? I actually have the exact number in the book, so you know, I, I, I promise I have done the math. Um, so how do, you, how do you address that? It's an extremely unlikely event. <clears throat> so. The, the thing that we have to understand about statistics is that, yes, highly improbable events are improbable. But there is a significant difference between improbable and impossible. And improbable events are happening all the time. All the time. So if you say event has a 1 in 100 chance of happening, that's an improbable event. But that means in 100 chances, that's going to occur. Well, and if in those 100 chances, um, OK, so sorry, lost my train of thought. So an event, 1 in 100, it, 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 it's going to occur 1 in 100 times. If that event happens, like for example, an airplane taking off, or landing, if that event happens thousands of times an hour, then that highly improbable event is going to happen hundreds of times a year, right? So the you know very improbable, you're going to get kicked off a plane, but it happens to a lot of people every year. Then how do we? How could we then? So let's flip. Let's flip the script. If I were a believer in these supernatural powers, how would I? then show that supernatural powers were the reason for my inclusion in this improbable event. Is there a way to do it? Yes, there is. We absolutely could. For example, we said there were four or five people kicked off that flight. If those people didn't know each other, had no connections whatsoever, but three out of the five of them were believers in these magic crystals, 
Would that be a statistically significant event? Would that be something we'd have to look and go, wow, that's actually pretty unlikely. Do we know? The answer is we don't know because it depends on how many people on the plane had those crystals to begin with, right? So again, you have to, you have to be careful. The easy answer, eh, you know, math, right? Um, so if, but again, so let's say big plane, three out of the five people, and those three people were the only people on that plane who were carrying crystals and they had no connection whatsoever, da, 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 da. You know what, guys? That's an argument I would lose. I would have to go, okay, that is actually really difficult to explain. That is a statistically significant event that gives credence to your argument that those crystals have power. Let's take something that's a little more real world, all right? People are diagnosed with cancer all the time, right? Lots of people. There are about one in, I believe the number is one in 5,000 people who are diagnosed with cancer. Sometime later, they go back to the doctor, that cancer no longer exists. It's no longer there. It happens. Now, my Magic Man A scenario was a made up scenario. This cancer statistic is a real thing. And it's something that believers will, will use as evidence of supernatural because cancer just can't heal itself. We don't understand. Doctors can't explain that. So therefore, the only possible explanation is Jesus or crystals or Buddha or whatever, whatever your, your, your choice of thing is. And again, just like in the magic man example, we can use the same thinking set and say, you know what? Let's test it. Maybe you're right. So let's look at cancer prevalence in different populations. If I am a Christian, versus a non-Christian, is there a statistically significant difference in the odds of my cancer just disappearing versus the other? Are Muslims being cancer-free more often than Hindus? You can, there are you can look this stuff up and it goes nowhere. Because it turns out your system of beliefs, the deity you pray to, the activities that you participate in outside of health related activities and this kind of thing, the, 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 the system of belief that you adhere to has zero statistical effect on whether or not your cancer is going to magically disappear. It happens to everyone randomly. So this, to, now to the person who is a believer, God healed my cancer, right? But and well, he, I, you don't, again, my, my, my question is always, would you like to know why that's not true? I don't, I don't say that, right? But, but that's, that's how you approach this kind of discussion, okay? If, yeah, go ahead. This is a, a kind of clarification question. So like say you did get a response um, similar to what you just said where they're like, hey, God healed this. Sure. And are you saying that pointing out a saying like, we got to heal the Muslim the same way, uh -huh. is that a good argument or would that be Ah, we're, 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 we're getting, um, I, you're like the next statement out of my mouth, I think was gonna, was gonna cover it. It's a great question. So just for the camera, um, well, what about the, you know, if Christian gets healed, Muslim gets healed, well, maybe God just likes those peoples, right? Um, how do, th does that actually validate their point or not, right? Um, and, and so the 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 because the, the, the when when I when I push back right and when I say well statistically you know atheists are healed of cancer just as much as Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and whatever right uh, you know it's it's a smaller number in the United States because there's a smaller number of atheists but um, <clears throat> but over the population size and density you do the math it pretty much works out the same the way that believers will get around that fact is they'll say well. Sure, but that just means God loves everyone equally. Right? So that just means God's healing lots of people. And here's the answer to that. Okay, then let me ask this. 
If there's no difference, if there's no way to distinguish between events that happen by random chance and events that God drives, if there's no way to distinguish those two events, why is God necessary in the equation? You say it's prayer. You say it's beads. You say it's crystals. You say it's, you know, whatever thing you do, right? And you say it's the, the cleanse or whatever the thing is that you're drinking, right? Um, <laughs> if you cannot show a statistical difference in the outcomes based on your beliefs and activities versus <clears throat> just the random population and chance, then what does it mean to say God did this? There is no difference in that state between God and random chance. Now, another example that I give in the book is, let's say you're, um, you're, uh, you're playing the lottery, um, <clears throat> and someone who wins the lottery happens to belong to religion X. Right, uh, and that person says, "Oh, well, God knew I needed this money, and therefore I—that's uh, why I won the lottery." Praise the Jesus! Praise the Jesus! Right? Um, <laughs> that came out a little more flippant than I meant it to. Um, <laughs> yeah, I—I I have comics for a friend. It's—it's an it's occupational hazard. Um, so, if you know. How, again, how do we evaluate that? Well, you look at the population of people who win the lottery. And you say, do people who belong to religion X typically have a statistically higher chance of winning the lottery or not? Not, do more Christians win the lottery than non-Christians, because in the United States, most people identify as Christian, right? But do the people who are, is it a statistically significant difference? <clears throat> and, and if it is, at that point, you want to look at the back office, right? Who's, who's uh, you know, yeah, running the numbers, right? Okay, if, you know, hey, if, uh, if I'm, I'm telling you, if, uh, being a Pentecostal man, I had two and a half times chance of winning the lottery compared to everyone else. Pff, Pentecostal, baby, let's do this thing. Um, so, the, so, so again, it's... When, when, when you're evaluating these things, you give these, I, I give these examples, and, I, and this would be the way I would recommend engaging with people who, who want to engage on these kind of topics. And you agree with them before you even discuss their scenario that these are the ground rules. And if there's agreement on the ground rules, if they go, well, yeah, of course, I'll be able to show statistical significance, then then we can have the discussion. Then you get into, there, there are other things like personal experience, and I, again, I wrote about that as well. Uh, you know, my, my gas tank magically filled up and ran 4,000 miles on a single tank instead of the 400, you know. And, and again, these oddly improbable things that, again, you have to ask yourself the question, is there any other possible explanation for why that might have happened? Do you maybe have a neighbor who knew how hard up you were, and maybe was sneaking into your car at night and filling up your gas tank, because I, I know that's the kind of stuff I do, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> I've got witnesses. Um, so it's like, you know, that's, you know, I, so you have to, you know, take people where they're at, but before you engage, and before, you know, even, I mean, you, you can be confident. Because please, be confident, right? I don't know where you're at in your atheist journey, whatever they call that, right? There, like in religion, there's all these nice, like warm, fuzzy words, and I wish we had better ones in the secular community for the same kind of thing. But um, in, in your irreligious journey through life, right, you can, you don't have to wonder Man, am, am I am I really am I like risking hell for this or am I da da da? Because any time someone has done actual research and looked at the statistical significance of events, not only has it come to find out that prayer has no impact. There was one really famous study, at least in secular circles, where there were uh, two groups of heart attack patients that were being prayed for. Uh, one, one was being prayed for, one was not. Neither group knew, so it was a well-controlled study and whatever. 
and there was a statistically minor, statistically significant impact. The people who were prayed for had worse outcomes. <laughs> <laughs> It's just one study, right? So it doesn't prove anything. But the, you don't have to wonder, am I on the right track here, right? Um, you don't have to worry about hell. And you don't have to worry about this stuff. And, and you, you, can, you, know, you can stand up for like groups that are disadvantaged in this country and know that you're doing the right thing regardless of what some ancient book says you should do or say because it doesn't hold up under scrutiny right there's there's nothing to uh the the arguments about miracles most miracles are just wow congratulations you're lucky matter of fact this room is full of some of the most amazing miracles ever, if you want to get down to statistics. Aw, thanks, Matt. Except for that one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> because you do the math, right? Um, the egg that you came from was one of a million eggs in your mother's womb. The sperm that fertilized that egg was one of 200 million sperm fighting for attention, if you will. <laughs> so right off the bat, what's a million times 200 million? It's a big number. It's a two with a lot of zeros behind it, right? The odds of your existence just on those statistics alone are mind boggling. 200 trillion. 200 trillion, thank you. Now. It's not even close to the actual improbability of your existence. You, your mother did not ovulate all the time, right? So there wasn't always an egg. Your father, he's, okay, it, there, there's a lot of sperm going through the system. Let's just, let's just put it that way, right? It's, it's a fairly frequent occurrence. <laughs> Oh, this is on video, isn't it? All right, okay. Um, except for me. I'm the exception. All right, so... <laughs> right. So, so someone actually did the math on this, and um, in the book, I, again, I, I go through the numbers. Um, but the odds of you being born exactly as you are are the same odds as I think it's the city of Los Angeles. Every person in the city of Los Angeles being given a trillion sided dice, <laughs> rolling it simultaneously and everyone coming up with the same number. The odds of you actually being born are way out there. And yet, here you are. The odds of any given person being born are infinitesimally small, more miraculous than any other miraculous event that has ever occurred in human history, and yet, here you are. So those statistically improbable events, they happen all the time. It's just a matter of luck. It's a matter of random chance. And so we can appreciate being lucky, right? We can appreciate and value our lives because, wow, I should have just been half an egg and half a sperm that never really went anywhere, right? Yay me, okay? <laughs> and we can celebrate that and we can appreciate being lucky without attributing supernatural influence or meaning. And that's a perfectly fine and acceptable thing to do. That's my talk. Any questions? Uh, discussion? <laughs> so to me, it's, it's, I think, the, and I think this is a fairly commonly held uh, belief amongst the secular, is the need for prayer or the desire to pray uh, fulfills this very deep human need to have some kind of control yep. over events that are outside of their control. I liken it to, um, I was wearing this shirt when you know, the Cubs won the, the ball game. So I have to wear that shirt right. every time they play, otherwise they won't win. As much. Hey, right. Players, I want to get that on record. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs>
pineapple is a sin. <laughs> so I mean, I think it's it's this it's this desire to have control yep. um, over over something that is absolutely uncontrollable. Wouldn't you say? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I I'd say so. I mean, but there's also again, um, in so as a believer when I had moved out of my fundamentalist phase, right, I no longer believed that my power had the ability to supernaturally affect the universe, right? Um, but there, uh, I, I also subscribe to a belief that, um, you know, uh, sure, God um, may, may not do anything because of my prayer that, it, that he wouldn't have already done, but he not only um, uh, dictates what's going to happen, but he also dictates the means to that end. So my prayer was still important, even though it was all predetermined, right? Um, which again is very much the same thing of saying, well, God just cures everyone's cancer that gets cured, right? If, if, if you can't distinguish an influence in a behavior, activity, or whatever, then you know it, it's the same thing as that not having an influence. Which then leads to if God's curing you know some people's cancer just because He likes to cure cancer. Right. Why does He cure everybody's cancer? Oh, don't don't even get me started. Right. That, that's a whole different conversation. Um, that that's easy why to go is down. Cancer in the first place. But and and but the, make it stronger. Yes, but, it's character building. And, and, and what, one reason why I, I don't go down that road with those people mm -hmm. is typically. The person who is using this story as a means to um, try to convince me of the validity of, of supernatural influence, um, either they're the ones whose cancer disappeared or it was someone who they're very close to. So um, I'm, I'm simultaneously trying to say, hey, look, yeah, let, let's sit down. You, you want to talk about this? Fine. Let's, let's reason it out. I'll explain to you why this doesn't really do anything for me. Um, but I, I, I try to keep it personal because it's very personal to them. And the fact that God doesn't cure anyone else's cancer, who cares, right? Um, how many cancers does he have to cure before you acknowledge him as God, right? And it's the, and you just, it just goes down rabbit holes that aren't, aren't really meaningful. But, but yeah, it, it's a good point. Definitely. Yeah. Are you familiar with the street epistemology movement? So, um, yeah, a little bit. But yeah. Because one, one of the strategies, do you know about Peter Boghossian? You know what you know yeah. about him? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> what I like about what they do is it, you don't have to get into arguments like that. Basically, you just, what you do is you just say, um, you know, if, if somehow it can be proven that prayer doesn't work, would you still believe in God? Right. And, and then if they say, yeah, then you say, well, so that's probably not the reason you believe in, right? In other words, it doesn't really, yep. it's not a criteria, and you kind of go down, and usually it ends up being about something like feelings, or they feel the Holy Spirit, or whatever it might be. And, and then you just ask them, well, you know, is it possible it could be for some other reason, or those feelings could be other reasons? Right. And of course, it's not like you're gonna convince anybody in a conversation anyhow. And, I'm not saying that's the better way to do it, but I just, for me, I like the fact that you don't have to get into arguments about statistics then. Yeah. The Bible. yeah. Now, there are some people that they won't even enter into that kind of a discussion I'm talking about. I'm right. Telling. Or there are people that no matter what the answer is, it's like, well, it, it, yeah, if I could, if I knew that prayer didn't work, I would still believe in God. Yeah. And, and it gets... It, or, or and, and it and, and it doesn't matter how far down you go, there, there's still turtles all the way down, right? They there's always going to be a god down there somewhere for for certain people, right? What, what it does though, it does peel back all the all the things that they want to talk yeah. about. Right? And, and it really usually gets down to one or two things that they put their belief on, and then you kind of work with them on that. Yeah. Um, and you, and the other thing is, it's like you don't have to take a stance; then you just ask questions. Yeah. Which I think it's what's so beautiful about it. Right? Yep, yep. No, and I am I, I, for um, people who engage in that kind of stuff. I think for, from a general populist perspective, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's probably a lot more effective than than than, than, than my methodologies. Mm -hmm. But um, those methodologies would not have worked on me. I'm, I'm a little. I'm a. I'm a odd duck as far as like the reasons I believed. I, I was very heavily invested in math and probability mm -hmm. in order to. Um, you know, uh, prop up belief in the supernatural. So, uh, for for me, this 
you know, so, you know, so for most of, most of you guys, listen to what this guy says. If you run into an odd guy like me, pull out the calculator, right? <laughs> I don't know if you heard about it. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and I'm, I'm a big fan, actually. Yeah, very much so. This actually kind of goes along with what you were saying. Uh, I kind of did that to myself to um, kind of figure out why I believe what I believe. I mean, being raised that way and kind of just following along was part of the big thing. Right. But then I realized uh, after like a lot of like self-examination that I enjoyed that time to think and to like, it was kind of like meditation, but you didn't sit down and call it meditation. So like <laughs> that prayer was me like kind of explaining what I wanted to happen. But then when I got rid of all the like the guilt and the the, I don't know what you want to call it, the, the, want to, the wanting for things to happen and like, uh, and like put it back on myself, like why isn't this happening? Right. That was like a lot more powerful than prayer ever could be for me. Yeah. Just to just use like actual meditation and like self-reflecting to like do things with my life instead of just wanting them to happen. And I think, I mean, my parents or you know, all four of my, all the kids, all four of us left Catholicism and it, uh, we're, I guess, my grandparents are also really Catholic, very Catholic. My grandma's practically like a nun. Right. I don't remember what she calls herself, but it's like somewhere in between. And uh, no. none of them. <laughs> <laughs> none of them know except for like uh, my parents kind of know. But yeah. Um, I would love to see that like one day for them to just kind of like get out of it because like my dad is so logical. My mom's kind of a dead so it's, it's like uh, <laughs> I love her, but she like she may like be that, and that's fine. But like I don't know, just like. It's one of those things that I think when you try to get people to look at it as for what it is, as like a, a sort of meditation, then they might not real they might realize they don't need like the asking God part. They just need to like sit and talk to themselves for a little bit. And, right. Um, for one of my best friends, I actually kind of helped him become an atheist, and that was what kind of drove him was being able to drop that and be able to drop like being guilty because he was also a Catholic. Right. And, it's very liberating. Yeah. And. It's, it's unbelievably liberating to yep. like finally just stop like just go to basic morality like you were talking about like you can still help the marginalized people absolutely you don't need a reason except for the fact that it's right right and yeah. I think that's really cool and yep what you to say. I've had friends say well why do you talk to people you don't want to change their minds and you know it's like I changed my mind. Right. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it's like, a, it's not like you're going to walk up and someone's going to say, oh, you know, really, I've been holding these beliefs for all, like, these 30 years, and you're right, I'm really, it's crazy, but it's not like that. I mean, my, you know, my, the unraveling of my faith was a long process. I mean, I was like 49 years old before I figured it out. Yep. I mean, it was always, it was slowly eroding, you know, as I went through, but, you know, that entanglement with family and, and all those beliefs that you have. Oh, and, and the community you know, that surrounds it. And, oh, good, good, I, good night. I, yeah. A preacher to lead the faith. Yep. I don't, I just, that to me, that's just amazing bravery. I just. <laughs> I don't know if it's bravery or stupidity. It's one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could be, could be. Yeah. There's usually not much difference. <laughs> Somet <laughs> sometimes. Well, I, I think it's not. Yeah, yeah. I think it's not so much, uh, just real quickly, that's not so much about immediately converting someone right. to your point of view. Right? Yeah. It's, and, and it's the same in anything, any other kind of discussion, whether it's religion, politics, culture, whatever. It's not to immediately win them over to your side. It's to plant the seed, yeah, yeah. to cause them to think about their own beliefs yeah. and not just like, oh, I've suddenly seen the light because you criticized my belief. So, Emily, um, the next meeting, do you still have copies of my book? I the do. paper. I meant to grab them when we were at my apartment. Uh, and you just so forgot. Okay. So, so the, the the PDF of the of the second book not as interesting for some of these conversations. Um, I actually uh, had had a box um, of of books that we were using at a conference that we were putting on in St. Louis. Uh, it was a misprint box, so they shipped me a whole another two hundred and fifty copies. So I had all these extra books, and I have donated them to Sasha. And so um, the they're it, still like perfectly fine. It's not like it's, it's like there's like a little glue strip in the back or something. Like, they're just slightly yeah. Bumpy, um, I guess so. Uh, can can you bring? Can you bring those to the next Sasha meeting, or? I, I can do my best. So, so, so someone be sure to remind my daughter to. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so it's 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 a really short book, easy to read. I it, it's I mean it's nothing earth shattering in there, but um, but but basically, so the question was, uh, I think some of you guys were here la when I was here last year, right? So yeah, so you guys heard my story. Um, the, the high notes are um, a Southern Baptist minister, uh, youth youth pastor, and and that kind of thing. Um, I was actively and heavily engaged in apologetics. Right, so the the, de the defense of the faith and, and this kind of thing, uh, which again numbers mattered a whole lot to me because th those were I thought are the, the best defenses. Um, you know the whole uh, the there's one statistic about um, the odds of uh, Jesus uh, matching up with uh, 17 of the prophecies in the Old Testament are the same as stacking the entire state of Texas a foot and a half high with quarters, painting one of them red, putting a blind man in the middle of it all, and he reaches down and magically picks up the one red quarter, right? Um, and that is a truish statistic, uh, assuming you accept the, val the validity of ev everything that's behind it, right? But then you also, again, you have that sharpshooter fallacy, right? Because how many people lined up to it that died and were never made popular, right? <laughs> so that, you know, those, those kind of things. But I was um, huge, huge into apologetics. Um, and then um, over time, uh, there were three three core beliefs that I had that, that basically uh, uh, under my face. Man, I hope I can remember these without prepping them. Um, <laughs> Uh, one was, this was before the uh, Human Genome Project and all that had been mapped out, uh, we would find significant differences between our DNA and uh, chimpanzee DNA, right? So evolution. Uh, we would not find transition fossils, right? Um, and then, um, oh gosh, there was a third one. And, and the, it's the, the, the law of... Um it's that one like physics law where like you. Oh yeah, vir virtual particles, right? Yeah. So, um, so virtual particles are uh, uh, in in physics, they're uh, matter that appears and disappears. You have equal parts, particle and antiparticle. They appear for an instant and then they they go back together. Um, th they had been theorized for decades. Um, and I, uh, in, I, I would take those three stances, and I would say because I'm so sure. God is real and there's no other explanation. Virtual particles don't exist, right? We're, we're going to test for them. We're not going to find them. We're not going to find transitional fossils. And we're going to find uh, significant differences between our DNA and, and chimpanzees, right? And I was wrong on all three counts. And so for me, um, that, that, that was... Um, earth shattering. But uh, again, I was intellectually honest. I, I, I would walk into these conversations and I'm like, look, if you're right, I want to, I want to know. I, I want to change the way I live my life as a result of what is actually true. Um, my, my approach hasn't changed, right? I just know better than to make, make bets on supernatural influence. <laughs> Which, by the way, the virtual par particles argument, if you ever get pulled into a conversation with a street preacher that you do not want to be in, and they say, why don't you believe in God? And you start talking virtual particles and quantum physics, they will back out of the argument. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good way to save yourself some time. <laughs> I, usually, I usually go to speaker circle and just talk to them about extra time. Yeah. yeah. Kind of fun. Yeah, I, I remember when I used to have extra time. Oh, those were the good old days. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so uh, come to Sasha next week. Emily will remember the books and um, just just get one. You'll you'll see. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm 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 fundamentally the same person. I, mean, I have I have a lot of different beliefs now, right? A lot of different views on what's right and wrong. Um, but but no, I. Um, oh God. <laughs> it's, it's it's not good. Um, yeah. No, my uh, my family either. Either I have disconnected because of my choices, right? And certain things I'm just not willing to live with, um, or in a lot of cases they have, they they have as well. Um, and it's the only ones who really held on are the ones. Man, I wish they just let it go, right? Um, so no, I um, uh, when I when I was coming out and I talk about this a little bit in the first book, um, I was very strategic um, about because I, I was probably an atheist for about a year before I mentioned it to anyone outside my wife, right? Um, and then I uh, 
uh, I made sure and built up, like I started attending meetups and I'd introduce myself as a th Southern Baptist minister who is now an atheist and I haven't come out yet, so no pictures, please. You know, that that whole thing, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, I, I spent about four or five months building up a social circle and friends and this kind of stuff uh, before I went public. Where was this? What city? Uh, so I live in uh, like St. Peter's, Missouri. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so not, not far. That's a pretty big community there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they, um, and there was like a, a meetup that was just getting off the ground. It it, it disbanded last year, um, mainly because there, there there's almost a sense of um, it, it was prevalent enough. We didn't really have to, we didn't really need a meetup anymore to 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 find people, right? It's uh, you know the whole rise of the nuns and all those kind of things. N O N E S, not N U N S. Um, <laughs> The whole, the, the whole rise of the nuns is, is, is part of the overall population. I mean, it's it's really um, even in the Midwest. You know, five years ago was a very different profile, faith profile than what it is today. Um, you know, I mean, your older people and whatever are still you know very religious by and large, but um, man, you you guys are changing the world, yeah. and it's it's fun. It's gonna be fun to watch. Are you suggesting this is one more thing we can thank the millennials for killing off? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, I am, hey, praise Jesus for the millennials, right? I mean, there's no other explanation. Take okay. credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, millennials. I was actually talking to, them, I work with a lot of international students, of, uh, a couple of them from China. Right. I think it's pretty interesting that anybody really believes in anything over here. Well, right. Because at least for the younger people, it's like almost not existent on the map. Well, right. No, and, because uh, again, None of us would have believed any of it if we'd been 12 years old the first time we heard it. Right. Right? I mean, yeah. yeah. Have you heard of this right after Santa? You'd be like, come on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Man. Well, I, Santa, I was like, wait, what about the rest of that? <laughs> oh, dude. Uh, Man, I was, I was like, I was older, as an older kid. I was like seven or eight years old before I, before I finally forced my parents to do a corner on Santa, and I, I threw a hissy fit. It was, it was, I, I, I kicked a hole in a wall. I literally, like, stood at the bed, bed, bam, 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 and boom, foot goes through the drywall. And I, Okay. What did you guys say about Santa? <laughs> <laughs> He's my favorite person. <laughs> right. Ho, ho, ho. Uh, uh. I do want to say real quick, it is past 8 o'clock to the meeting. is like officially over, but like you're welcome to stay and chat up my dad and whatever. Yeah, yeah I'm happy to stick around and talk. We have the room until what, 9? 9 o'clock. Yeah. But uh, guys, th thanks for coming and thanks for your questions and attention. This is, uh, you know, I uh, actually told Emily, I'm, my, my new job, I drive uh, about at least twice a month uh, between St. Louis and Kansas City. So this is now, you know, I, I'm passing by Columbia on a fairly frequent basis. So um, I'm normally tired, but um, <laughs> but um, yeah, if, if there's ever a time when I can help out with stuff, I mean, this is this is a good group. And uh, you guys, it, even, even, if, even if it's like in, in St. Peter's, right, where the significance and like the, the need for this kind of community is less because the culture itself is getting less religious, it's still important that this group exists because there are always going to be people coming out of Catholic homes, right? And, and they, you know, it's like they, they need a place uh, to land. And even if it's a small group, big group, it doesn't matter. They just need a place to land. So what you guys do matters. So thank you. Thank you. All right.